This recording will cover Chapter 43 of the ATAG textbook, Principles of Antimicrobial Therapy. Antimicrobial therapy is the use of medications to treat infections due to bacteria, viruses, or fungi. And it's important to know what the offending agent is, whether it's a bacteria, fungus, or a virus, because different types of antimicrobial therapy are used to treat different types of infections. Changes in the DNA of microorganisms called conjugation, which produces resistance to multiple existing medications, mandates the continual creation of new antimicrobials. So what conjugation is referring to, I'm sure you've heard at some point about a, um, a bacteria being uh, antibiotic resistant. And what it is is those bacteria can change right so that the medicine we're using to treat the infections are no longer effective. So that's why we constantly have to be creating new types of medications to treat infections. Super infection, sometimes called supra infection like the slide shows, is a type of resistance that results when an antibiotic kills normal flora, thus favoring the emergence of a new infection that is difficult to, el to eliminate. So normal flora is the normal healthy bacteria that's part of our body. And when an antibiotic kills off that good bacteria that's doing a job in our body, it can lead to problems for the patient. A big one that we'll see is C. diff infections. C. diff is a bacterial infection caused normally when the patient's receiving a broad spectrum or really strong antibiotic. And what can happen is it kills off the normal flora and it, allow, it allows this other bacteria that's in the intestine, the, the C. diff, to spread sort of out of control. And it leads, leads to problems with pretty severe diarrhea, which can lead to um, colitis. So when you hear itis, you think of infection, colon, we're talking about uh, inflammation. I'm sorry, when you hear itis, you think of inflammation. We're thinking of inflammation of the colon. Leads to colitis, severe watery diarrhea, problems with dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. Antimicrobial medications can work by different methods. So when you're studying different types of antimicrobials, whether it's penicillins or azithromycin, you need to know what's the method that it uses to uh, prevent the offending agent from infecting the body or making the infection worse. So one way that antimicrobials work are by destroying the cell wall that is present in the bacteria. Another way is by inhibiting the conversion of an enzyme unique for a particular bacteria survival. The medication may impair protein synthesis in the bacteria's ribosomes. It could also disrupt bacterial synthesis or the function of the bacterial DNA or RNA as well as inhibit viral replication. Now we just got a couple of terms that you need to be familiar with. What's the difference between a narrow spectrum and a broad spectrum antibiotic? A narrow spectrum antibiotic is only um, sensitive to a few types of bacteria, to a narrow or small uh, amount of bacteria, where a broad spectrum antibiotic is sensitive to a wide variety of bacteria. Antibiotics can be classified as bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Bactericidal medications are directly lethal to the microorganisms, so that cidal indicates that it's killing off the microorganism, while the bacteriostatic medications slow the growth of the microorganism, and then the immune system um, steps in and finishes off the microorganism, destroys the bacteria. So bacteriostatic you can think of it as like static or slowed growth of the bacteria that allows the immune system to come in and take over. When selecting an antibiotic, when the prescriber decides what they're going to prescribe to treat an infection, three principal factors must be considered. One, what's the identity, identity of the causative agent? Two, what's the sensitivity of the infecting organism to an antimicrobial? And three, any other factors, including location of infection, age, allergies, and immune status of the host. So first we'll talk about identity of the causative agent. Laboratory testing of body fluids such as blood, urine, sputum, and wound drainage identifies the microorganism causing the infection. And the big thing is that you'll hear of in the clinical settings is a CNS, or a culture and sensitivity. So the C in CNS stands for culture. And a culture is basically when a sample 
of the microorganism is taken. It could be a urine sample or, or a sample of drainage from a wound, um, a sputum sample, but that sample is then grown in a culture medium, right? And that's how we're able to then identify what the offending microorganism is. So in a CNS, a culture and sensitivity, the culture part of it is the actual identification of the causative agent of the infection. In terms of nursing implications, it's important that we obtain cultures prior to any treatment with microbials. Um, so before we start an antibiotic, we always wanna get our samples or our specimens first. And that's a big thing. Well, it's important obviously in nursing, but in NCLEX style questions, you'll see that frequently um, where the answer refers something to the effect of getting a culture prior to starting treatment with antibiotics. Also, nurses must collect fluid for culture carefully to prevent contamination. So in a CNS or a culture insensitivity, culture is identifying that offending microorganism. S of the CNS stands for sensitivity. Sensitivity of a microorganism lets us know which medication is effective at killing the, the microorganism. For organisms commonly resistant to medications, technicians test the sensitivity of the organism to various antimicrobials. And there's different ways that they can do it. Um, but I just want you in general to understand that the sensitivity identifies what medications we can use to treat the infection. So there's different things that can go on that can affect how an antibiotic or an antimicrobial works. And one of the things is the patient's immune system. Is the patient or client immunocompromised? So when we say immunocompromised, hopefully you're thinking that their immune system isn't working properly. So if my immune system isn't working properly, if I'm patient A, immunocompromised, and then you have patient B with a, who's a healthy 20-year-old, and we both get a sort of nasty cut on our leg, who do you think is going to be more likely to develop a more severe infection? It's going to be your patient who's immunocompromised. The body normally does a pretty good job at fighting off infection, but if that immune system isn't working up to par, then that patient's more likely to have an infection, and they're actually going to need those stronger, stronger bactericidal antibiotics. The site of infection can affect how well antimicrobials are able to work. For example, infections in cerebrospinal fluid, where the antimicro antimicrobials have to cross the blood brain barrier, can have a difficult time crossing that barrier to help to fight the infection. They have to specifically use a medication that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, endocarditis. Itis, you see that inflammation again. CAR, CARD, you should be thinking of um, cardiac. So this is a, a problem with the heart. Bacterial infiltration within the heart. What happens here is we have bacteria that is sort of hidden within thrombus on, inside the heart on the valves and it can be difficult for antimicrobials to, to um, engage that infection and be able to treat it. Anytime there's poor blood supply, the body's going to have a hard time fighting off the infection. Think about what your blood's bringing to the infection site. It's bringing um, all the players of the immune system, the white blood cells, the phagocytes, all those things are important to, for the body to treat uh, an infection. Also, if we're taking a medication, it needs to get to that site of infection through the bloodstream. So poor blood supply uh, would be bad for treatment of an infection. Finally, phagocytes who attack foreign objects such as implants like pacemakers or prosthetic joints uh, become less able to destroy microorganisms that colonize around that foreign object in the body. When we're thinking about medications, age plays a role, right? The very young and the very old. The very young, the infants, their problem is their organs aren't working up to par yet. Their organs aren't fun functioning at a normal level yet, which causes slow excretion of any medication and can lead to toxicity. On the other hand, the older adults, their, their, their liver and kidneys, they were functioning well, and now as they're getting older, that function starts to decline. And that can also lead to problems with medication metabolism and excretion, which can be a problem with toxicity. In terms of pregnancy, you do want to know that antimicrobials can harm a developing fetus by crossing over the placenta. 
Sulfonamides can produce cronicterus, a severe neurologic disorder, which is brain damage due to the buildup of bilirubin in newborns. Gentamicin can cause hearing loss in infants, and tetracyclines causes discoloration of developing teeth. Toxicity to these antibiotics is more likely during pregnancy. Lactation or breastfeeding is usually a contraindication for antimicrobials because of possible danger to breastfeeding infants. Another problem with treating an infection could be the presence of a previous allergic reaction. And you'll see this PCN abbreviation commonly in your charts. And that stands for penicillin, which is one of the most common uh, allergies or, or um, medications that cause an allergic reaction in a patient that you're going to see in the clinical setting. Clients should not receive penicillin after an allergic reaction, which narrows the choices of antibiotics used to treat infection in those patients. Combining antimicrobials or using more than one type of antimicrobial could be used for different reasons. These reasons include to treat severe infections, to treat infections for more than one microorganism, right? You have more than one microorganism. It makes sense that you'd use more than one type of microbial um, medication. Prevents bacteria resistance from causing an infection. Um, with TB or tuberculosis treatment, you're going to use more than one medication to help prevent resistance um, of the bacteria to those medications. Using more than one antimicrobial also decreases the risk of toxicity by reducing the dosage of each medication. So you have more types of medication, but lower dosage of each type. Finally, it produces an effective treatment, a more effective treatment than using only one antimicrobial medication. Combining antimicrobials can cause adverse effects also, including increased resistance to antimicrobials, increased cost of therapy, more adverse or toxic reactions, antagonistic effects between a combination of two or more antimicrobials that results in decreased effectiveness and then finally there's an increased risk for super infection when you hear the word prophylaxis you should think prevention all right so indications for prophylactic use include prevention of infections that may occur during surgery so you may get an antibiotic prior to surgery you don't have an infection but they know the risk for infection is high. So you'll get a prophylactic antibiotic to prevent any sort of infection during surgery or right after surgery. Um, prophylactic antibiotics may also be used or antimicrobials um, after sexual exposure if there's increased risk for any sort of sexually transmitted infections. Use of antimicrobials for individuals who have certain conditions, such as a prosthetic heart valve prior to dental or other procedures because of the increased risk of bacterial endocarditis, and also for patients with recurring UTIs, they may take prophylactic antimicrobials. This final slide goes over preventative measures for infection. So hand hygiene is obviously top of the list and, and very important to help prevent the spread of infection. Also, recognizing invasive procedures that increase, increase the risk for infection. Um, the indwelling urinary catheter used to, used to be used much more frequently than it is now because of the high risk of caudies or catheter-associated urinary tract infections. IV catheter, cardiac catheterization, any of those invasive procedures can introduce bacteria to the body. Uh, we want to make sure we encourage patients to have up-to-date immunizations. A big NCLEX question is making sure that the patient understands they need to take the full course of antibiotics, every pill, even if they start feeling better, even if their uh, red, oozy wound on their leg starts looking better, they need to take the full prescription of antibiotics. Also want to use infection control procedures to prevent transmission of resistant microorganisms. And finally, we want to evaluate the effectiveness of treatment.